Um, we're going to get started. I um, want to welcome all of you. I am Artie Rye. I am an intellectual property and health law professor here at Duke Law. I suspect some of you have seen me around a bit. Um, I am substituting for the dean, Dean Carrie Abrams, and the dean's office, as we know, sponsors this lecture. She's um, regrettably had a last minute conflict and can't make it, but I'm hoping to, uh, to provide a substitute in her stead. Um, so it's wonderful to see so many students, faculty, and staff here today, as well as members of the larger Duke community um, for our annual Lang Lecture. Just to give you a little bit of background, the Lang Lecture was established to honor Professor David Lang, who is here, and we will talk more about that in just a minute. Um, Professor Lang retired from Duke Law School in 2015 as the Melvin G. Shim Professor of Law after 44 years on our faculty. A beloved teacher and renowned scholar, Professor Lang specializes in intellectual property copyright, trademarks, unfair competition, and entertainment law. Very appropriate for our, for our lecturer today. Professor Lang is particularly well known for his transformative work on the public domain, including his 1981 article, Recognizing the Public Domain, and his 2003 article, Reimagining the Public Domain, both of which were published in Duke's own Long Contemporary Problems. He is also the co-author of the Natural Property Law Casebook and the author of a book entitled Intellectual, no, excuse me, No Law, colon, Intellectual Property in the Image of an Absolute First Amendment, which he wrote with our own fellow Duke professor, Jeff Powell. Prior to Professor Lang's retirement, this endowed lecture was known as the Kip and Meredith Fry Lecture in recognition of Professor Lang's career and contributions, the Fry's renamed it in Professor Lang's honor following his retirement. Alongside his wife, Terry, Professor Lang is here today. So please join me in recognizing Professor Lang and his many accomplishments. It is now my great honor and pleasure to recognize this year's Lang Lecturer, Professor Rebecca Tushnet. Professor Tushnet is the Frank Stanton Professor of the First Amendment at Harvard Law School. So we see a First Amendment theme here. At Harvard, she teaches courses on advertising law, copyright, and trademark and unfair competition. Her scholarly work currently focuses on the relationship between the First Amendment and false advertising law. Professor Teshnet also happens to be an expert on the law of engagement rings. So I hope you ask her about that. <laughs> Professor Teshnet received her bachelor's degree from Harvard College and her JD from Yale Law School. After graduating from Yale, she clerked for Chief Judge Edward Becker of the Third Circuit, and then for Justice David Souter of the US Supreme Court. She has practiced intellectual property law at Debevoise and Plimpton in Washington, DC. And prior to joining the Harvard Law Faculty in 2016, she taught at the Georgetown University Law Center. Her incredibly creative and influential work on copyright and trademark has been featured in the Harvard Law Review, the Texas Law Review, and the Yale Law Journal, among many other law reviews and journals. Just last year, she published the sixth edition of her casebook on advertising and marketing law. Her website, the 43B blog, an inside joke for trademark lawyers, has been consistently cited as one of the top 10 legal blogs by the ABA's blog 100 list. Outside of the academic sphere, Professor Tushnet is a founding member of the Organization for Transformative Works, a nonprofit group dedicated to the preservation of fan fiction and other fan works. 
She is herself a writer of fan fiction. Please join me in extending a warm welcome to Professor Rebecca Cheshnett. Thank you for that, and uh, thank you for coming. Um, so I wanted to talk about two things today uh, that are happening uh, or about to happen in trademark law uh, involving standing and commercial speech doctrine. Um, and I'm going to spend most of my time on commercial speech. Uh, but I begin with a factor that is likely to influence both of these things, um, which is that Roughly one third of the judges on the federal bench were not there six years ago. Most of them were not even asked about their views about intellectual property at their confirmation hearings. Um, but a substantial number of them were chosen in order to reject major parts of the post-war legal order. It'd be surprising if that didn't have effects on intellectual property law for good and for ill. Um, indeed, we're just starting to see those effects now, uh, including among judges who might not be recently appointed, but recently feel let off the leash of precedent. Um, so in the related area of First Amendment law and content moderation, we see that in the recent Net Choice versus Texas case, uh, in which the Fifth Circuit rejected decades of precedent um, to uphold state regulation of private content moderation decisions. Um, closer to my, uh, my focus here, and probably quite relevant to Duke's licensing department, um, there's ongoing litigation in Pennsylvania where the district judge was willing to ex accept that existing practices of licensing uh, college logos for apparel and for other promotional goods might well have no foundation in pr trademark law properly understood. Um, and as a disclosure, I'm consulting with the defendant in that matter, um, but I raise it here to make the point that things that we thought were stable are not stable anymore, and that's not just the marquee, you know, headline-grabbing areas of law. So I want to talk a bit about standing. Um, over the past century, Trademark has embraced a number of extended theories of harm, so affiliation confusion. Consumers might be confused about the relationship between two parties who they understand are distinct, but think might be in partnership. So if they think that, for example, um, you know, Head & Shoulders actually manufactures a house brand for CVS, maybe that's actionable. Post-sale confusion. So the person who buys is not confused, but someone looking at them uh, as they walk down the street with their, you know, Skechers shoes, might mistakenly think that they're wearing Adidas shoes. Um, and uh, that's uh, actionable confusion. Initial interest confusion, where uh, you uh, uh, start an interaction with some entity, you realize that it's not the one you thought it was, but it's fine. Um, or you don't have time or whatever, uh, and you continue to make the transaction without being confused at all, that's actionable. Um, so these are situations where there's no you know, conventional, uh, there's certainly no counterfeiting, no false advertising. Um, there are no lost sales. Uh, and especially um, the, the reaction of courts seems to be that the problem is free riding, as well as um, courts have made up these harm theories where, like, well, if it turns out the product is bad, or if the person's sketchers are really terrible and they're falling apart, like, Adidas might be blamed for that. Um, and without actually requiring uh, people to prove the steps of the harm theory, they have accepted that because it could happen, we're going to presume that if there's confusion, it does happen. Uh, in all circumstances. Um, and likewise, uh, the rise of the dilution cause of action, which is explicitly founded on the idea that there would be no confusion, but uh, there might be blurring or tarnishment. The, the trademark might become less unique, um, or somebody might uh, use it in a way that, although it doesn't confuse, ca uh, somehow casts aspersions. So Google pornography uh, would be an example. So as one example of the uh, expansion of harm theories, uh, Jose Cuervo was held liable for using a dripping red wax seal on its tequila, uh, which costs uh, $100 a bottle, um, because the court reasoned that consumers don't understand corporate relationships. 
Uh, and because they don't understand the relationships, they might think that it had been partnered with or acquired by the same company that made Maker's Mark because they both have dripping red wax seals, even though there was no evidence that consumers had ever actually been confused or that they'd care uh, if they were confused. Um, or for that matter, that a way, a standard way of signaling partnership is you know, just using the red wax seal as opposed to like sharing a name. Uh, so trademark law treats as real risks of harm that have not materialized. The risk that the defendant's goods might someday be poor quality, even when there's no evidence they're poor quality now. In trademark cases, courts have gotten around the lack of present injury by saying that loss of control over reputation is itself an injury. But, and here's where the standing comes in, that sounds a lot like theories of harm that the Supreme Court has now explicitly rejected uh, in its most recent Article III standing cases. Um, so in TransUnion, the idea that somebody's data may have been exposed um, was not enough without a showing that it had been exposed. Um, distinctions can and will be made, but um, lawyers really need to think harder about what they mean by trademark uh, uh, harm. Unfortunately, the 2020 Trademark Modernization Act actively works against that. It actually imposes a rule that if confusion is likely or dilution is likely, irreparable harm is presumed. So you don't have to show harm ever. Um, the point, uh, it, uh, no, no, no statute can override Article III's requirements. Um, the Supreme Court has just told us that. But the point is that in the face of those developments, trademark continues to head in the opposite direction, including in this 2020 amendment. Um, that divergence may not be able to hold for very much longer. For example, in a case called Animal Legal Defense Fund versus Reynolds, uh, it's a case invalidating Iowa's um, second most recent law trying to suppress animal rights organizations. Um, so it made a, it a crime to enter an animal facility under false pretenses with the intent of recording what goes on in the facility. Um, so one judge uh, who is concurring and dissenting in part wrote, it make little sense for the court to condition the scope of First Amendment rights on what contemporaneously supports standing under US law rather than on what supported standing under US law in 1790. That would imply that the scope of First Amendment protection contracts over time as Congress elevates new harms to the status of legally cognizable harms for the purposes of federal law. Worse, it would allow Congress to bootstrap laws into compliance with the First Amendment by elevating harms associated with the false speech that the laws regulate to the status of legally cognizable harm. So we have here a kind of supercharging uh, Article III standing doctrine and First Amendment doctrine, both of which are constraining the ability of the regulatory state to act. And, and uh, my point here is not that you know, the law should have been upheld, but that uh, really, if you're serious about this, trademark law should get the exact same kind of scrutiny. Is this a real harm? Is it an imminent harm? Um, or is it just something that you know, we, we've hypothesized and not proven? Um, so, the, uh, so this is in part a question, I, I think, in some sense of judicial honesty. Is the, are these doctrines f just for striking down stuff that, you know, weren't fa that isn't favored by the political party that appointed you? Um, or are these doctrines really about you know, uh, it constraining even you know, likable uh, or politically non-salient exercises of government power. Um, so my second topic um, is uh, probably less controversial only in comparison to the first, um, which is trademark law's treatment of non-commercial speech, um, which is fundamentally confused. Um, and here I'm going to argue that an injection of general First Amendment doctrine might be able to help us figure out how to do it better. Um, so I'm going to tell you how I came to this topic. Um, in the past two years, I've written basically only amicus briefs. Uh, and most of the trademark ones were about a case called Rogers versus Grimaldi uh, and its rule for so-called expressive speech. Um, I hate the phrase expressive speech because it's such a category error. There may indeed be something called non-expressive speech. But uh, commercial speech, uh, which is, uh, it, which is uh, the opposite, uh, is not non-expressive. Right? Commercial speech is asking you to buy something, which is indeed an expressive act. 
Um, when commercial speech causes trademark confusion or other kinds of deception, it's confusing because it's expressive. Uh, nonetheless, courts often write as if uh, expressive speech is a separate category from um, uh, communicating a commercial message or communicating a message about source. Um, I started thinking that I needed a better account of how the law ended up with this obviously wrong characterization of expressive speech as the opposite of commercial speech and how we could do better. So the baseline is this massive expansion of trademark scope over the last century. Uh, in response to that expansion, courts mostly implicitly devised a compromise by which they would pull trademark back to a more traditional anti-fraud-like scope when it's applied to non-commercial speech sold in the marketplace. So movies, newspapers, songs, visual art, um, or used as the name of an organization with dues-paying members, so a political party or a congregation. Um, the key here is that when I say uh, they've used trademarks to just uh, police fraud in those narrow areas, uh, I don't mean fraudulent intent. I mean materially deceptive effects resulting in economic interactions with the wrong party. This compromise explains an otherwise surprising feature of the cases, which is that political speakers and religious speakers can often expect worse outcomes when they're sued for trademark infringement than so-called commercial publishers engaged in non-commercial speech. It's given the kinds of cases brought against them uh, it, that explains why the religions uh, and political parties do so comparatively so badly. So uh, Jennifer Rothman has done some related work, but um, her focus has been on differing definitions of commerciality across IP regimes. I'm interested in a different question. Holding constant the definition of commercial speech as defined by First Amendment jurisprudence, which is essentially something that proposes a commercial interaction. So it doesn't have to say so in that, those, that many words, but if they've got something to sell and they're telling you about it, it's probably commercial speech. Um, and so, basic question, does the Lanham Act cover uh, at more than commercial speech? Unfortunately, there are three different answers to this question. They're all regularly used in every, any given jurisdiction. This is not a matter of splits. Uh, and the answers are yes, no, and sometimes, um, which uh, I, I find both comprehensive and dismaying. Um, so, uh, Starting uh, with the first category, the defendant is engaged in non-commercial speech, um, but it is selling that speech in the marketplace. Um, Ginger and Fred was the name of a film about Italian dancers during the Depression who were nicknamed Ginger and Fred after the popular American uh, film stars Ginger Rogers and Fred Astaire. Ginger Rogers sued for uh, claiming false endorsement. Um, and she had survey evidence that 43% of those exposed to the film's title connected the film with her, and 27% of those exposed to the film's ads connected uh, uh, the film with her. In addition, um, she had evidence that when the publicity department at the uh, movie studio got the initial information about the film, they started pulling pictures of her and, sort of, and thought it was going to be about her, but it wasn't. Um, so, Roger sues for trademark infringement. The Court of Appeals, um, in affirming a finding that there was no infringement, set, set a rule that the titles of artistic works are not going to be subject to trademark liability if the title is artistically relevant and it's not explicitly misleading. Um, so, something like the official Ginger Rogers cookbook if not official, could uh, be, uh, be infringing under Rogers, but uh, Ginger Rogers, a biography, could not be. Uh, likewise, Ginger and Fred, although it wasn't about her, uh, it was artistically relevant because the characters in the film uh, had, were likened to Ginger and Fred uh, over the course of the film. Uh, so this is picked up by many other courts. Um, it's applied to many other situations, including the content of, of a work. So if you have um, a, a, a strip club in your video game and it happens to look a lot like a real strip club, um, Rogers applies to that. And I just want to point out here, that seems like an expansion of Rogers beyond titles, but that expansion is actually driven by the fact that it's 
fundamentally weird to say, oh, yeah, people will choose their video games based on whether the strip club in them is a real strip club or not, or whether there's permission to depict the strip club uh, in it. Uh, so, uh, so, so Rogers, in one sense, is just kind of clawing back some of the expansion that has taken place, at least with respect to non-commercial speech. Um, so uh, one way of seeing Rogers is as fitting neatly into a libertarian First Amendment. So in one recent case, the 11th Circuit dealt with a challenge to MTV's Floribama Shore, Shore which is an, an inheritor of the Jersey Shore franchise. Um, and the challenge is brought by the Floribama Bar, which claimed to have invented the portmanteau word for that area of the country, um, the Florida-Alabama Shore. Uh, the Court of Appeals thought this was an easy case under Rogers. Uh, it's, you know, it's a title. It wasn't explicitly misleading. It was artistically relevant. Um, and the concurrence said some very interesting things. Um, uh, so the judge, Judge Brasher, who appointed in 2019, um, treated trademark infringement claims as presumptively invalid speech suppression by the government. So he wrote that liability under the Lam Lanham Act gives priority in the marketplace of ideas to whoever speaks first and silences the speech of the second speaker, even if both parties are using a trademark in the title of an artistic work. The First Amendment question is the same. Should the court invoke the Lanham Act to silence the second speaker's speech? And he said the answer should be the same as well. He quoted a Supreme Court case about trademark registration, which says, the First Amendment forbids the government to regulate speech in ways that favor some viewpoints or ideas at the expense of others. And his conclusion was, absent a neutral time, place, or manner restriction, one person's right to speak cannot justify silencing a second person's speech. Taken seriously, that suggests that the entirety of trademark law uh, which is not a time, place, or manner restriction, but a content-based regulation of speech, needs to face skeptical, even strict scrutiny. Um, and of course, the presence of commercial speech doctrine, which historically has given lower scrutiny to regulations of commercial speech, matters here. But it's quite striking to me um, that he sort of didn't even uh, see that as an issue. So uh, we recently got. Uh, a Supreme Court case uh, involving these parody dog toys. So one question is, how drunk would you have to be to not be able to tell these apart? Um, and of course, the key to understanding why this is a Supreme Court case is to understand that's not actually what trademark law tries to do anymore. Uh, it tries to do so many more things. Uh, and it clearly is based on the Jack Daniels bottle. Uh, and that's enough to get you in the door. Uh, so uh, the, uh, the argument that I made uh, uh, in an amicus brief uh, is that uh, courts have, in general, applied the Rogers test to speech that qualifies as non-commercial under the Supreme Court's First Amendment precedents. So if speech is an advertisement for something else, it's commercial. But if speech is itself the product being sold, then it is non-commercial speech that just participates in uh, the, the market. Um, so Rogers itself draw, draw, uh, drew an opposition between artistic expression and commercial speech. Um, but there's other things in, uh, in those categories. Um, there was oral argument in the case early this month. And at the oral argument, the Supreme Court seemed nervous about granting First Amendment protections to so-called commercial products. So, you know, the, the dog toy just seemed, you know, undignified uh, compared to other things that they've given protection to. But the court also seemed well aware that selling speech does not remove its First Amendment protection. Um, because they are final, they may be able to come up with a distinction between t-shirts um, which they clearly recognized as you know, regularly used to deliver important social and political messages, even when they're sold for profit, um, and dog toys. Um, to me, I think that, would that distinction would require a sociological inquiry into the social meaning of clothing uh, versus dog toys that's somewhat out of step with recent First Amendment precedents. Um, but it could certainly be done. Right? 
uh, generating new rounds of litigation over whether uh, mugs and calendars are more like newspapers or more like dog toys. Um, I hope they don't do that, but they might. Uh, Justice Alito at oral argument raised an interesting question, whether the test for likely confusion should be objective instead of empirical. So uh, that is, when you look at these, you say, it would be stupid to confuse these. right? Uh, and nonetheless, Jack Daniels comes up with a consumer survey that says 29% of people think that this is a Jack Daniels product. Um, and so the, the idea of an objective reasonable consumer test would be to ask not what a substantial number of consumers do think, but what a consumer ought to think. Um, and it's important for, for, for two reasons here. First, um, some of that confusion showing up in the survey is surely founded on ideas about the law. If someone asks you, um, you know, whose permission is required to make this, some number of people will answer, well, I guess Jack Daniels, right? without having any opinion about the law uh, or, or, or whether that's good. They'll just think, oh, the law must require it. Um, and second, and enhancing the effect of that first problem, courts accept low percentages, sometimes even under 10%, uh, to establish uh, likely confusion. And so if one in eight people thinks that a use requires permission, courts often make that the legal rule. And this is pernicious when it comes to things that, uh, are, that the trademark owner might object to um, as a, a form of commentary. So, in, so Walmart, for example, uh, sued a guy named Smith who made some t-shirts uh, that said on the front, Wal Qaeda and Wallacost, and had some other references to you know, Stalin and Mao and so on, uh, because he objected to what Walmart was doing to you know, small communities. Walmart sued him, and their surveys showed that 59% of people thought uh, that Walmart was involved in the Wallacost and Wal Qaeda t-shirts. Right? Uh, so so the, the empirical project uh, is going terribly. Right? And so there's some reason to, to appeal to the idea of an objective, reasonable consumer, which also would link trademark law more closely to uh, concepts like defamation, where historically courts have done a screening of what the objective uh, uh, reader would think, having read something. Um, at other points, the oral argument suggested that the justices, like most non-trademark lawyers, didn't fully grasp just how expansive the formal doctrine has gotten. So, you know, most people's mental model of trademark centers around counterfeiting. Trademark infringement is when a consumer buys something thinking it comes from another per producer. That's confusion over source. But unfortunately, as you saw, trademark law is now much bigger than that. And trademark owners have leveraged our intuitions about the harm of counterfeiting to cover situations where consumers aren't confused about anything that they care about. Um, so immaterial confusion. Uh, it wasn't obvious from the argument whether Rogers would survive at all or be limited to other forms of speech, you know, like t-shirts and video games, you know, the classics. Um, but even if it does survive, uh, Rogers itself may not fully replicate direct First Amendment analysis of a liability claim against non-commercial speech. In general, outside of trademark, the content of non-commercial speech may be regulated only to further a compelling government interest. The regulation has to be narrowly tailored, and it has to be the least restrictive means of accomplishing that compelling interest. At least in its explicit falsity prong, Rogers does tailor potential liability for non-commercial speakers more closely to classic fraud. So it excludes most non-commercial speech from trademark liability. But there are several uh, remaining problems. First, uh, that first part of the Rogers test, is it artistically relevant, uh, wrongly puts the burden of justification on a non-commercial speaker and invites errors. So uh, for example, uh, consider the question, uh, if I paint a portrait of a sunflower and I call it Rosa Parks, is that title artistically relevant to my painting? Right. So anybody who you know, had at least a moderately OK high school English class should probably be able to generate some connections between the image and the title. 
Um, so too, if I paint a picture of a dumpster fire and I call it Rosa Parks, right? We can also do that. Uh, and, we, and courts aren't particularly good at that and they, they probably shouldn't have any business deciding when your message is you know, artistically uh, clear enough to justify your speech. Um, and indeed, the Sixth Circuit uh, made this exact mistake. It found that the title Rosa Parks might not be artistically relevant to a rap song that was about the rappers uh, boasting and ordering everyone else to the back of the bus. Um, because freestyling apparently is not an ar artistic, uh, uh, does not create artistic relevance. That's bad. Um, second, uh, Rogers does not impose a materiality requirement. And it's just hard for me to see how the government has a compelling interest in protecting consumers from confusion they don't care about that doesn't affect their decisions. It also, uh, as presently formulated, does not require courts to consider a disclosure remedy instead of the full range of Lanham Act remedies, including injunctions and damages. Um, so that suggests a failure of narrow tailoring. So Rogers uh, is imperfectly matched to the general requirements for regulating non-commercial speech, but by drastically shrinking the set of potentially infringing non-commercial speech acts, it does eliminate many potential conflicts with the First Amendment. So things that happened before, like uh, a court enjoining the name of a movie, they couldn't release the movie Dairy Queens. Um, it was ultimately released under the title Drop Dead Gorgeous, um, even though Dairy Queens, uh, you know, they thought was a better name because the court, without any evidence of, of, of actual confusion, said, oh, you know, people will get confused about its relationship with Dairy Queen. Um, so Rogers fixes that kind of thing. Um, and it does leave room for liability when there's an explicitly false claim, say, that a biography is authorized by its subject, um, which would meet the ordinary requirements for fraud. So in Rogers' cases, most non-fraud-like conduct has been excluded from the scope of the Lanham Act making its application to First Amendment non-commercial speech seem tolerable. And what I want to highlight now is that we actually have other sets of cases. So um, these are uh, cr cases of pure criticism um, that provide a contrast to Rogers. So courts have increasingly found that uh, critics just aren't engaged in anything that the Lanham Act covers at all. Um, and they say, well, it's not commercial speech, therefore it's not covered. And one important thing to note is that compared to that, Rogers is actually much more pro-trademark owner um, because it does hold out the prospect of liability for non-commercial speech. Um, but here, uh, in cases of what I've called gripers, um, we have uh, courts finding that uh, people aren't engaging in, in covered speech at all, even if there's some tenuous connection between the allegedly infringing speech and a distant potential for the defendant to profit. So uh, when a critic re registered fallwell.com, um, the, the Fourth Circuit said, yeah, we, we don't think that's covered. Uh, similarly, the Ninth Circuit, in a case called Bosley versus Kramer, said it's not commercial speech to register a domain name that is just the, the trademark of the trademark owner, but all you do is criticize the trademark owner at that domain name. The Fourth Circuit in Radiance Foundation versus NAACP likewise said that an ad calling the NAACP the National Association for the Abortion of Colored People was not within the scope of the Lanham Act. Uh, so the Sixth Circuit has reasoned that the Lanham Act is constitutional because it only regulates commercial speech, which is entitled to reduced protections under the First Amendment. Um, the Sixth and other cases uh, cite uh, Representative Kastenmeier's statement about the 1988 revisions of the Lanham Act um, to say that the law specifically extends only to false and misleading speech that is encompassed within the commercial speech doctrine developed by the U.S. Supreme Court. That and again, this is a conflict with the Rogers cases, which do apply the Lanham Act to non-commercial speech, albeit with a modified test. It'd be hard to maintain that Fred and Ginger is entitled to reduce protections under the First Amendment or encompassed within the commercial speech doctrine developed by the US Supreme Court. In practice, many of the griper cases say that they're following First Amendment pr precedents only as to a subset of non-commercial speech that which does not solicit the purchase of the speech itself. There are other cases that do involve some solicitation, 
Um, so the Radiance Foundation case, they're fundraising for their own organization, uh, and the court still found that this was non-commercial. So these cases do more than create a conflict with Rogers and its progeny. Um, they also create a conflict with a third line of cases. Um, the Lanham Act is applied with no adjustment whatsoever, formally, uh, when political or religious plaintiffs, as opposed to ordinary marketplace actors, bring suit against competitors who claim to represent the true ideology behind the trademark. So uh, this is a case out of Louisiana, and you can see why, right? Uh, uh, the, they are uh, quite plausibly confusing, even in political endorsement situations. Right. So uh, uh, it, you, in the abstract, it might seem odd that political and re religious speakers are the ones who are losing cases in this new uh, free speech environment. Um, perhaps they lose because courts are in practice more sensitive to private commercial interests at this point than to uh, public, political, or religious interests in speech. My hypothesis is there really are a higher percentage of fraud-like cases litigated under the political and religious uh, headings um, than in ordinary trademark dis disputes, given the general expansion of trademarks so far beyond fraud. But the formal justification for the results in these cases is not based on any explicit distinction between ordinary expansive trademark law and non-commercial speech that materially deceives people about who's speaking. Instead, in these cases, courts speak in blanket terms about whether the Lanham Act applies to political speech. They say yes or they say no, um, which usually renders rough justice in the case before them, um, but it creates problems for the future political speech uh, of people who might not be uh, speaking politically about a direct ideological competitor. In religion cases, it's a little bit worse even. There's no meaningful division in the cases. Um, breakaway sects are routinely enjoined from using the names that they believe truly reflect their religious commitments. Right? They believe they are the Southern Methodists, uh, and the court tells them, no, you're not. Um, so it's fascinating that courts in artistic speech cases have reassessed the weight of First Amendment defenses in, in, over the past few decades, but they haven't done so in these religion and political cases, some of which are fairly recent. Um, Unlike Rogers' cases, these cases say uh, that courts are in agreement that there is no exception to trademark law for religious, political, and cultural expression. This is a framing that accepts trademarks' coverage of almost all fields of human endeavor, rather than seeing coverage of non-commercial speech as an extension in need of justification. While Rogers rejected any consideration of whether speakers had adequate alternatives to using the plaintiff's trademark, on the rationale that speakers are entitled to talk about what they want to talk about. Um, the religious cases embrace the concept that uh, if you have an adequate alternative to calling yourself a Southern Methodist, then you have to use it. Um, indeed, it may not even be what's called descriptive fair use to use the name of the religion from which you have parted. Um, and as long as believers are allowed to use generic terms to identify their faith, the courts say, they may be enjoined from using non-generic terms as the name of their church, a distinction that courts are confident they can make. Um, I admit to some skepticism that courts can reliably distinguish a faith from a church, um, but anti-fraud principles arguably explain why audience interests outweigh schismatic believers' interests in describing themselves in ways that they believe are truthful. The breakaway sects, by all accounts, sincerely believe that they are delivering exactly what they say, the religious services associated with a faith known to them by a particular name. To disagree with them in the trademark context does seem to require holding that they're wrong, that they're not delivering the true faith, um, at least according to the name by which it's known. Some of the work is also done by the idea that trademarks only extend control over names and logos. Uh, of a congregation and not to other elements of worship. But, you won't be surprised to hear, trademark law elsewhere extends far past product names uh, and logos to things like a building's layout, slogans, uniforms, and other aspects of the product itself. 
Indeed, the PTO has granted registration for NKJV for Bibles, referring to the New King James Version. If a, a church adopted a distinctive name for God, then general trademark law would, in theory, allow it to prohibit other churches from using that name. So court's use of this distinction between the faith and the, the church seems to be designed to limit sex trademark control over anything but a name or logo, which aligns it with an anti-fraud regime, but not with modern trademark law. Another factor contributing to the siloing of religious uh, schism cases is that most analysis of their First Amendment implications focuses on free exercise, not free speech. Courts have said that applying trademark law to schismatics is not a free exercise problem because the governing law is based on neutral principles of who has priority of use and who has the legal right to control the trademark. But the treatment of gripers suggests that, in fact, uh, religions are being treated worse than other non-commercial speakers, at least at the level of the general principle being applied. And the Supreme Court has recently begun to suggest that religions may be entitled to a kind of most favored nation treatment, that any exception or limit on a generally applicable law must be available to a religion. At a minimum, therefore, it would seem that the schismatics would be entitled to either total freedom from the Lanham Act, like the Gripers are, uh, or Rogers-style explicit misleadingness analysis, um, and that the small differences in entity names or the presence of clear disclosures of non-affiliation should be enough to avoid liability. Compared to the Rogers cases, the religious cases reveal a startling inattention to the defendant's own interest in expressing itself in a way uh, that is truthful to the defendant's own beliefs and intended meaning. So uh, some thoughts on what this might mean for trademark law and for the First Amendment uh, generally. Um, so, Right now, non-commercial speech both is and isn't covered by the Lanham Act. Um, cases like Rogers seem protective of the First Amendment interest in non-commercial speech, but only because the baseline coverage of the Lanham Act has grown so broad. Compared to the Griper cases, which clearly state that the Lanham Act covers only commercial speech as the Supreme Court has defined it, uh, that is, invitations to transact in the marketplace, Rogers is fairly weak tea uh, it holds out and occasionally delivers the prospect of liability for non-commercial speech, even if consumers don't care about the source or sponsorship of the speech at issue. They just want to listen to a catchy song or buy a funny greeting card. A version of Rogers that focused on material deception about who is speaking would be consistent with the political and religious cases uh, and the griper cases, despite their varying answers to the current question, does the Lanham Act apply? Um, so the answer, yes, but only where consumers are materially harmed in ways that resemble classic fraud would actually be a perfectly coherent rule that explains almost all of the cases. Um, it, you just have to do it differently. Explicitly limiting non-commercial trademark infringement claims to situations that meet the fraud pattern Right, a speaker's use of a name that causes confusion with a direct competitor, plus deception that's material to consumers, could force courts to confront the fact that trademark law now prohibits everywhere else immaterial confusion among a small percentage of consumers who are not deciding between two competing products. And that doctrine itself might deserve some rethinking, especially as the Supreme Court continues to raise the constitutional protections for truthful, non-misleading commercial speech. So one question worth exploring is whether modern trademark law, both in confusion and dilution, really counts as regulating deceptive speech by constitutional standards. There are also some broader lessons for First Amendment law, I think. Um, and the most important is, should we care about intent or should we care about effect? So uh, the political and religious liability pattern is material consumer deception often minus insincerity. So you might think that these guys are pretty clearly bad, bad actors, but there's another case where uh, United We Stand America versus United We Stand New York, where um, the, there's a breakaway political party that insists they are keeping the true faith. So we, you know, we are the United We Stand uh, party, and you know, as far as I can tell, they're completely sincere about it. They believe they've been betrayed, and they believe they're the real United We Stand party. 
Um, so that that seems like a pretty you know, legitimate ground of disagreement. Uh, at the same time, it was very clear that a whole bunch of people who are interested in the party were confused. They're sending their money to the wrong place. This happens in the religious cases too. People come to town. They want to be in one church. They end up in another because the names are too confusing. Right? That's a real harm. But it's a harm that it can, doesn't have to be the result of deceptive intent. We think of the special Santa requirements for defamation as being kind of the, the core of the modern First Amendment, that uh, you can't be held liable for defamation uh, without showing both falsity and the requisite mental state, which can't be uh, just like being wrong. Um, but perhaps that Sienta requirement is specific to the risk of chilling negative speech about other people, uh, given who sues for defamation and why. Since it turns out we are very willing to suppress core political and religious self-identification when it seems both material and deceptive to outsiders. Uh, the other thing that uh, this might give us some insight on is a question that's being debated hotly now. Um, should companies be liable for the outputs of their AI tools, which cannot have a relevant mental state? Uh, and if we take defamation's Santa requirements as setting the model, it sounds like holding them liable will be hard. If we say, no, Santa is actually uh, uh, tailored to a specific set of concerns about the abuse of defamation law, sometimes you don't need Santa to punish false speech, um, then we could get a very different answer. So um, I, I want to have plenty of time to, uh, to talk, because I'm sure I've said enough offensive things to uh, uh, generate at least some pushback. So um, I will leave it there, and I welcome your questions. All right. So we have about um, 10 minutes for questions, and I will just go ahead and do the calling, because um, I don't want Mr. Um, Pishnet to have to worry about you two. So let's not be shy. This is the First Amendment, after all, so it's important to speak. If not, I will ask a question to lead things off. Jamie. Great, great, fascinating conversation. Great uh, speech. Thank you so much. Um, the question. Uh, from my point of view, um, the question of what jurisprudence the Supreme Court will wear when it uh, does ID cases is effectively random. Um, <laughs> that is a crazy eight ball. So you have Star Atlantica. It's sort of like in which Justice Thomas comes to a really extensively remarkable conclusion, which is that the whole thing could just be solved by reading the statute, which he then proceeds to get wrong. Um, and then you have, and then Justice Thomas keeps on going in these things, you have cases like Oracle versus Google with Justice Breyer's sort of IP swan song, and where it's sort of like, oh, and the, the textualism is, is almost nowhere to be found. Um, you have been diving into this much more deeply. Do you see some deeper set of trends in the cases you describe? Because from my point of view, what you described was a swelling maximalism, but also a sometimes swelling minimalism that both coexist oddly right. across right. circuits randomly with like initial interest confusion dying and then coming back to right. life and so forth. So I, you seem to see to be suggesting at least more of a firm trajectory that I at least can perceive from my more limited. So I don't want to say it's a firm uh, trajectory. What I want to say is uh, two, two things. Like, what is the distinctive project of law, right? It is uh, like we think of ourselves as reason givers. And, and the distinctive project of judges in particular compared to legislatures is judges are not supposed to make arbitrary distinctions where legislatures must right, in order to function. So uh, in light of that, it is, it is reasonable to say to courts, OK, so pick, right? Uh, and, and that's really what I want to do, because uh, otherwise, uh, otherwise they're not really doing law uh, as a project. And you can completely disagree with that. Uh, right? You can say you know, that's unattainable. But there are kind of local 
successes and failures. And, and this is one where, you know, as you say, the minimalism and the maximalism have sort of been heading at each other for a while, and they're now both so developed that there is pretty much no way around it. And uh, in, in terms of, uh, you know, it, what can we expect, I, I make no predictions about the Rogers case. Um, but I will note that um, the petitioner's position was, uh, well, just read the statute. It says all confusion is actionable. And very early on in the argument, uh, one of the justices pointed out, yeah, but we also have this First Amendment thing, right? Uh, and we do have a lexical priority there. And so we've got to do something. Uh, and I don't know what it will be, but I, I, you know, the, the point here is to suggest what that might look like, depending on how you resolve things like, should we care about intent? My limited understanding of the First Amendment is that it's one of the few areas where maybe the justices can agree with one another. So would that incline towards a First Amendment maximum? So, yeah, so I'm not sure they can. I think that the, uh, there have been several cases where they reach the same result, but for wild, wildly different reasons, suggesting that the next case is actually completely indeterminate or you know, will be. Uh, and also, of course, there's three new justices uh, who you know, haven't even got a chance to weigh in on a whole bunch of this stuff. So um, I, I, I don't think you can expect something completely coherent coming from people with you know, nine different philosophies. But in, in, in their own way, you know, I hope that each of them actually has to think about Okay, which of these and why is going to be the model? Great. Okay, well, we have lots of hands. Um, well, Professor Lang, you should. No, 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 no. no. You're Lexical priority. Lexical priority. <laughs> exactly. Absolutely. whether copyright has any future, or if it has any future, whether it has one that is anything much more than cabin by a kind of preliminary approach to problems that writers on the past would be able to consult editors and lawyers about when they are at will. Um, I had a conversation with Paul Goldstein about this a number of years ago. We both agreed that having taught copyright for decades and trademark law for decades, um, that it, it, it had begun to be much more interesting in, in the doctrinal terms to think about trademark law, but troublesome to see the disappearance of copyright law as a law central to the exercise of, of creative work. I'm curious to know what your own reaction is. Yeah. Sorry, go on. Well, so I mean, speaking as someone who loves to teach both courses, I mean, I, I think you're right that tra so trademarks, uh, trademarks imperialism has been justified by the fact that unlike copyright, it, it is centrally concerned with the reactions of the relevant consumers. So whatever they think, in theory, becomes the law unless some other overriding principle comes in. Um, and so I think we've seen that in, in a lot of ways. But, it, but because, the, uh, so in copyright, you have some situations where copyright owners can try and build markets and therefore like, increase their rights by showing that you're taking away from a market I have made to function. Um, that actually can be quite difficult in certain circumstances. Say, for example, creating a licensing market for parity. Uh, you know, not everyone is willing to do it in the way that it turns out they're willing to license it to iTunes. Um, Whereas trademark owners face less of a coordination problem because their individual efforts to convince people that permission is required just sort of courts assume that they redound to the benefit of everyone else, right? And that, you know, oh, licensing is standard. So we, you don't have to show that licensing is expected in this situation. Um, so I, I guess I would say they remain 
both significant, just in very different ways. Um, trademark is now approaching a condemnation of anything that looks like free riding. So one of the most significant limits might well be copyright law, where the Supreme Court in the Daystar case said, uh, basically, if something is in the public domain, then you have a right to copy it and to copy without attribution. So uh, that, is, that comes in as a non-confusion-based you know, barrier against trademark liability. And that may be the kind of thing that we have to look for. Right? So my you know, version of Rogers is, is a weaker version of that because I'm just saying, let's find materiality first right, before, before we do anything about it. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, it, I think it is the central problem of, uh, of our time in terms of the legal regulation of expression uh, if, if through, through property rights. Yeah, so, uh, so I think Professor Silby's work is great and important. And I think she's, mo she's focused in, in that argument on sort of conditions of production, right? Um, and in some sense, like, I don't think that the trademark side has anything to say about that. If anything, you know, trademark law tends to obscure conditions of production so by blessing things like the fact that Nike gets to you know, say it owns a trademark when, in fact, it owns no factories whatsoever. So, uh, you know, I think there's definitely room for a similar critique of trademark law. Um, it, you know, it's not, it's not what I'm doing here, but it, it's, it's uh, the expansiveness of trademark law is not just in what con it considers confusing, but actually in what it considers non-confusing, if done by the trademark claimant. Uh, whereas historically, uh, courts would have said, hey, you know, you got to make the stuff yourself. Um, but now everybody knows, oh, that's silly, that's naive. Right? And maybe there was actually a, a good idea in there that if you wanted the benefits of trademark, you should actually make the stuff yourself. And if you want the benefits of globalization, then you, should, you have to give up some trademark control. Right. Um, like, are there order effects? Like, right. Order so I, yeah. I, um, okay. Uh, this is just my my extremely personal opinion. Um, it does not appear like the court is functioning very well right now. So uh, and no. Uh, so uh, six opinions from this term have been issued. Uh, this is historically the biggest desert in opinions, uh, as far as I know. Um, the, the pace has never been this slow, uh, certainly not in the past hundred years. So there's something, uh, there, uh, whatever is happening, it is interfering with, you know, not just the hot button stuff. I think then that it's not clear that order effects can be distinguished from anything else. Like maybe, you know, they, they were, some of the justices said, well, I don't see, you know, I don't see the parody in the Jack Daniels bottle. Maybe it's because they're thinking of, you know, tra of, uh, of copyright. Um, I mean, I see what's funny about it. <laughs> but uh, it's true, like many jokes, you can't actually put it into words without killing it. Uh, but that doesn't mean it's not funny. Um, so, so I guess I would say, uh, I think things are so chaotic that there's, no, there's probably no way to untangle 
All right. On those, yeah. On that great.